So you have this protected water, warm water, calm water, with these truly remarkable shipwrecks waiting to be explored, waiting to be built. Welcome back, Wreck Watchers. If you have never been to Truck Lagoon, you might want to think about going soon. Time is running out. That's next on Wreck Watch. Welcome back to Wreck Watch TV. We're really glad to have you. And today we have the Dean of the Dive Academy, <laughs> Dean McConaughey. Dean, how's it going? All good. All good. How about you? Good, good. Amazing. Yeah, we just had a fun time at Shipwrecks uh, 2023. It's a busy time of the year. And um, to get back to Shipwrecks is cool because it's the first time that we've had a chance to to get together face-to-face -to -face in, well, three and a half years since COVID. Yeah. Um, talking with uh, the gang at Niagara Divers, they're saying that over 300 divers showed up. So wow, that that's was amazing. pretty cool. It was a, it was a, a great, great weekend. Um, it's always on in April for any of you local divers, um, put it in your calendar. It's a, it's a really worthwhile weekend. It, it fun. is a lot of fun. Great place to meet other divers and hear all kinds of amazing information about shipwrecks. Jill was there. Yeah. Jill, Ken, Ken Merriman, yeah. who always has some interesting things. Yeah. Um, it's a chance for me to catch up with Chris Cole. Many of you know Chris Cole and he's like an old high school teacher of mine. So, um, <laughs> all kinds of fun. Yeah. It was really cool. That's awesome. Really cool. Well, we're talking about shipwrecks and we are talking about Truck Lagoon, which you just went to. Yeah. We just got back. We were there in February, the, uh, just a couple of months ago. Yeah. And you had told me before that, uh, if I haven't been, I should probably look at going soon. Why, why did you say that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's true. Um, mother nature is claiming the shipwrecks back again. So what we're finding is uh, a whole lot of collapse and a lot of degradation. Um, I've been going fairly consistently over the course of the last 10 years. And it's remarkable to me how much change there is that's taking place now. So it's a, a combination of, you know, you got metal boats that are rusting because of course they're in salt water. Uh, the walls are starting to get thin. And then mother nature again is, you know, helping coral grow on top of it, which is adding to the weight. So you've got collapse, you've got bending, and you've got a, a whole bunch of change going on to the wrecks. I think truck will always be a dive destination. Certainly you'll always be able to dive there, but if you want to see the profile of the wrecks and see the vertical nature of it, yeah, um, the clock's definitely ticking. It's a bit of a snooze you lose. So for any of you who have not been to truck or want to go back and see it again for another time, um, sooner than later is, is the, is the right way to look at it. So you've been going for a while. Uh, there's a lot of people that maybe have heard of truck, but have never been there. Uh, yeah. describe for us, what is truck? It's a crazy story. So to begin with, uh, the Chuuk Islands, which is sort of the surrounding area around truck lagoon is an atoll. Okay. So when you think about an atoll, think about literally a prehistoric volcano that kind of blew up and left this ring that was left around the outside. The water rushed in. So it's kind of like a bowl then, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly, it's like a, it's like a protected pool in the middle of nowhere. So you've got deep ocean all around and then there's this weird little protected donut. And so the donut is calm water and protected water. So it really creates a natural harbor. And so in World War II, the Japanese used this protected harbor as a refitting and reloading and repair and maintenance area for their fleet in the South Pacific. So the story with regards to the shipwrecks is there was an American aircraft carrier that had reconnaissance planes up, and this is in the fall of 1942 and very early in the, in the year 1943, and the planes literally found Truck Lagoon and looked down and went, whoa. <laughs> and so they recognized at that point that they had found much of the Japanese Imperial fleet. So in February of 1943, this is where we always talk about the fact that the Americans get even at Pearl Harbor. Everybody knows the Japanese caught the Americans asleep in Pearl Harbor. Nobody knows that the Americans caught the Japanese asleep in Truck Lagoon. So in 24 hours of continuous barrage, uh, they dropped somewhere around 30 or 35 boats. They're still finding new wrecks and boats to this day. Really? Things all over the place that they haven't been able to find yet. So you have this protected water, warm water, calm water, with these truly remarkable shipwrecks sitting there just waiting to be explored, waiting to be dove. It is nuts what kind of diving it is. Just really cool. Just frozen in time. Just literally stop right there. A real time capsule literally. from World War II. Oh, it's it's awesome. The um the water itself in general runs anything between about a hundred and about two hundred feet deep. But don't let the depth 
you know, fool you because even though it's 200 feet, the, the wrecks are very tall. So you can get on them in many cases at 75 or 80 or 90 feet, or you can dive them kind of crazy in the middle, or you can dive them stupid down deep. So I was talking about it literally caters to all kinds of, all kinds of divers. I would have zero issues taking a new recreational diver to Truck Lagoon that has, you know, 25 or 30 dives under their belt so that they've got it together and they're just looking to have some fun. It is super easy diving. Water temperature, 86 degrees. <laughs> like it's like taking a bath. It's crazy. And visibility, um, I've seen it as much as 200 feet. You jump in the water, look down, and you can see the entire wreck and go, I want to go there, I want to go there, I want to go there. And what's that? Like it's crazy how it all it all works together. So it's it's an amazing place. Now, uh, you had talked before about uh, liveaboard versus land. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of ways of doing it. Uh, there's a, a remarkable liveaboard boat there called the Odyssey. It's been there for a number of years. Um, so you can kind of, you know, um, go upscale and, and live on the liveaboard and, and do those kinds of things. Um, or my scotch blood comes in and says, okay, let's try and find value out of this. And so we'll go and stay at the Blue Lagoon Dive Resort. Um, the guys are amazing there. We've got a great relationship with these guys. Um, the dive masters are top notch. And what Blue Lagoon allows us to do is vary the dive boats. So the dive boats are smaller dive boats. They're like 30 foot six packs or eight okay, packs. Yeah. So because we have larger groups that come with us and we've got varying degrees of capability as far as the divers are concerned, we can create like a rebreather boat and then a technical boat and a photographer boat and a rookie boat. So each of the boats caters to a kind of a, a cluster of divers that are all similar capability and diving similar profiles. So you don't have somebody baking in the sun waiting for a rebreather guy to come up and finish 45 minutes of deco. Right. And that way, the boats also get to pick different wrecks that cater to the needs of the divers. So we all get together again sort of at lunch. It's like, well, where did you go? It's like, well, what did I see? So it really becomes kind of a cool little mix. So doing land-based at, uh, at Blue Lagoon is the way that we do it. You brought your camera along, and uh, we're going to be looking at some of the footage. You're probably seeing it on the screen right now. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that we were able to shoot. Um this time when we were there was was really super. Um, we actually got onto a couple of wrecks that I've never been on before. Okay, they were a little bit deeper, but um, no issues. They were they were great. And there seems to be we were talking about degradation earlier. We're seeing that some wrecks are more degraded than others. Okay, so we think it has to do with current and salinity levels in the physical position. We don't know, but there are some wrecks you look like they just went down, and others are completely covered in coral and falling all apart. So it's, it's, it's kind of a surprise. You just have to hunt around and find your things. Now, every time you go, you find something new. You find uh, a new adventure uh, on each of these wrecks. What was your experience on this trip? I think you know, one of the first things that I always remember, um, the dive master that we were working with is Kieran, and Kieran's still there. He's brilliant. And we were, we were going back. There's a joke. It's, we talk about going back to the aircraft carrier. The Japanese needed air support in the area in order to bring in supplies. And they knew that they could land on an aircraft carrier, but they had all these little islands around. So they literally cut the top off of a mountain, filled in an area at the base of the mountain, and built an aircraft carrier. So from air, it looks like an aircraft carrier. It's called Eaton Field or Eaton Island. And they had this runway on it. And so when you've got runways, you've got planes falling off the end of the runway and crashing and doing all kinds of things. So the first time we were finished our first couple of dives, we go back to Eaton Island. There's a little parquet that they've got set up where you do your surface interval. So as we're pulling up to the island, I look over the side and go, what's that? And Kieran turns to me and goes, it's a zero. It's like, really? What? It's like, can I get my snorkel? It's like, it's like 10 feet of water. <laughs> So they dropped everybody off. We snorkeled onto it. Yeah. And Kiernan said, you know, be careful because the pilot's still aboard. Oh, really? Wow. So there is this weird humility that you find when you're diving these places. And so a lot of times when you talk about, you know, what's new and improved or, or impressions or excitement or surprises, um, sometimes it's just the humility and how you feel. There is a massive human element to this. Because, you know, you're going through the wrecks and you'll find, you know, you'll find boots or you'll find uniform. In some cases, there are some human res remains as well. And so it has this, 
this gravity to it when you're diving that is is really interesting. It it changes you. Well, it's easy to forget. I think when we go on these adventures, go on these excursions, and you're you're diving, you know, you're thinking about, you know, often you're you're on vacation, you're in the sun, you've got your your new deep diving license, and you want to try it out, and you want to go home and tell everybody, you know, especially all your non diving friends, hey, look at me. I went, I don't look at I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But so it's easy to forget that very often, most often, these wrecks had a human toll. Uh, there's casualties. There's people still trapped inside some of these sure. wrecks. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it is It is really easy to forget that each one of these wrecks has is a, is a tragedy. It's a destruction. And while we enjoy them today, uh, it comes with a very real cost. A huge cost. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting is, and, and I, I've never thought about this, but um, Sam, who's one of the, the head dive guys there, told me this a couple of years ago when I was first there. And Sam suggested that uh, the Chuuk people have this sort of love-hate relationship with the whole idea of being liberated. Because what a lot of people don't know is the Chuuk people were basically enslaved to work on the boats on behalf of the Japanese. Okay. So when the Americans came in and bombed the boats, all the people are watching their family go down on the boats. So certainly there are, you know, Japanese casualties of war and there are Americans' casualties of war, but there is a huge toll of the Chuuk people as well that went down to this. And, you, you know, you don't think about those kinds of things. And so that when you realize that you're coming in contact with the remains of someone, it's kind of like, okay, well, who is this? And, you know, were they, were they Japanese? Were they Americans that were on the boat? Or were they yeah. the Chuuk people as well? So it's just, war's a crazy thing. Yep. Yeah. War's and, a crazy thing. And it's, it seems strange that we have an entire industry based around tourism to places of destruction. Yeah, it's true. Lots of the places where, we're, you know, whether it be storms or whether it be loss of, of you know, of a man-made kind. Um, you're right. We get to take advantage of that now. I mean, depending on your attitude, you are in a, you could be in a sense honoring them as you are visiting these places and remembering that these people did exist and that they, you know, they had a, a role that pl to play in the world. We've talked for many times. I mean, some of the, the best things that you and I find that many divers that I know, specifically the photographers find is the ability to share what it is that we see when we're underwater. And so, you know, memory and, you know, and homage is all a part of that. So it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, years ago, I was doing a documentary and I was talking with the archaeologist and he reminded us that without destruction, we would have no idea of what really took place in the past. Isn't that interesting? That sends the message and delivers the information. How about that? Yeah, because uh, because if without the destruction, whether it was an earthquake or a terrible fire or most often battles where buildings have collapsed and the people have been, have been killed and left where they were, uh, you know, if they had just lived their lives and died of old age, uh, and everything was recycled and returned, we, we, we would never know, we would never know that these people were there and we would just, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't know their history, how they lived. We just create our own industries. I guess. Yep. How about that? <laughs> exactly. That's interesting stuff. Yeah. 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 That's great. Amazing. Well, I think, uh, by now you've probably seen a bunch of footage of truck while we've been talking about this and Dean, you have another trip coming up to truck in a couple of years. Yeah. We're going back in uh, February of, uh, 25. So if you're interested in coming, I'm thrilled. Just give me a call and we'll, we'll figure things out. Yep. I Amazing haven't stuff. been, I really we're want going to go this time. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> we've talking about this for a couple of years now. Yeah. Be great. It's, it's, it's a remarkable place. And you come back, you come back improved. It will challenge you, but it, it's really, it's an amazing place to get comfortable with a little more depth and a little more visibility and just scale. It just, it's, it's remarkable. It's a great training ground. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today, Always. sharing your adventures with us. If you want to check out Truck Lagoon, there'll be links in the bottom check out the Dive Academy. Uh, and Dean, I think we should talk about some other wreck sites, other shipwreck locations yeah, that it. you dive on. So stay tuned for that. There's a lot more coming up. Thank you very much for watching. We appreciate you guys always checking out our videos. And if you like this one, please hit like. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notifications bell because there's some uh, possibly some interesting stuff coming out that you'll hear on Wreckwatch TV first. Things are afoot. Yep, things are afoot. And we will see you next time. And remember, deep down, we care. <laughs>